Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega. I'm here with my co-host, Mike Laster. Mike, good to see you again. Good to be here, George. Okay, this is episode 168, Free Will. Why such a powerful illusion? Okay, and... All right, because um, <laughs> it is, it's an extremely powerful illusion. You know, we don't understand how people get it because logically it just doesn't make sense, but it is very power powerful, so we're going to explore that. But, like, before we do that, as we do in each show, and also, like, this is, like, Monday, August 4th, okay? So, like, just want to uh, mention it. So, like, before we get into, like, the theme, as we do in each show, we're going to basically describe what people mean when they say they have a free will, and then we'll briefly, as we're doing that, refute, you know, why what they mean is just impossible. And then after that, just before we get to the theme, we'll just, like, talk about why the show is important, why we're doing this. All right, so Mike, um, give one, one definition of what people mean when they say they have free will. It's any desire or action that you believe does not have a cause that was outside of your conscious control. Okay, and so like the reason like that's impossible is because like, you know, causality, because everything has a cause. Like for something, to make a decision, you know, free of something that's not in our control would be to make a decision free of causality, free of this law of cause and effect. That's impossible. Okay, um, what, what's another way that people, like, say um, they have a free will? They believe they could have done otherwise in the past. All right, so explain why that's impossible. It's impossible because, um, because of causality. It's just simply impossible because of cause and effect. Everything that unfolded had to have happened that way. There was no way for it to have been otherwise, simply because um, ever since the Big Bang up till this present moment, matter and energy um, just unfolded the way it did. And also um, the hedonistic imperative. We're always seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, whether it's short term or, or long term. And um, if you were to roll back time, um, then you would have done exactly what you would have d done to um, still be in that paradigm. Exactly. In other words, like if you say, well, I could have chosen otherwise, I could have done otherwise if I wanted to. No, you couldn't have because like at the time you'd made that decision, it was based on this hedonic imperative. You, you were choosing what you predicted was going to like create the best circumstances, like bring you the best pleasure in the future. And you can't escape that. We're hardwired bi biologically for that. All right, um, I think that's our, so let's get on to why is this, this show um, more important? I just, I want to go through this one reason, like there's this philosopher, John Searle, who uh, he was asked um, by a, a British psychologist for a book that was published in 2005, you know, if the world came to understand the free will is an illusion, what would that mean? And he said uh, that it would be a, quote, bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Newton or Galileo or Darwin, it would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe. Okay, I mean, like, end quote. That is, in other words, basically saying it'd be the the greatest scientific achievement ever. Mike, what 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 do you what do you um why do you think he chose those, those scientists in in his statement? Because at the time they were the most revolutionary. Uh, for Einstein to say that time is relative, um, Newton to actually demonstrate the causality of gravity, um, those were pretty big revolutions in uh, people's thinking. And so this would mean it's equally as significant. Excellent. Not more, which is what he's saying. Yeah, excellent. I mean, and the reason he, he 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 lumped all those together, you know, basically, essentially, saying this would be the the biggest, the, the greatest scientific achievement. You know, like basically, it would bring about an entirely new consciousness. Because Mike, uh, aside from the um, the scientific truth-based aspect of this, why else is what we're doing important? Because of people's uh, emotional lives. If you believe in causality, if you understand that things couldn't have been any other way, and that everybody around you, including yourself, is following the hedonic imperative, um, then there's much less incentive to um, take your feelings of hatred, seriously feelings of regret, uh, feelings of guilt, uh, feelings of uh, 
shame or uh, you know the idea of retribution even um, and it really opens up the space for more uh, compassion and forgiveness excellent ultimately. excellent in other words like it would make our, our world so much more benign would be so much better ourselves and other people we'd create a brand new world because because you wouldn't have a logical reason to blame others or yourself for anything and that would change everything all right so it would be supremely important we'd be creating a brand new world okay so like again free will why such a powerful illusion um mike you wanted to um describe this idea of like this um, the idea of religion and the concept of hell, wh why this, um, you know, um, why, how this plays a part of the illusion, or? Yeah, ultimately, um, the way religion tries to justify the existence of any sort of hell, especially the idea of eternal hell, is um, it, it proposes you did have a choice um, at some point and it sort of disregards the idea of cultural conditioning, it disregards the idea of um, biology and physiology, it disregards the idea of an unconscious, and it basically says you can freely will to do um, and be any way you want to be, and if you made the wrong choice, then it's completely your conscious mind's fault. Exactly. Can you understand the reason behind this? Now, like, back, like, the, 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 there was, like, actually, most people think that the term free will is in the Bible. It's not, okay? There was not, there was no term. Um, St. Paul writing to the Romans, I think, 49-7 or something, or, or no, no, I don't. Um, he, he basically says to them like you know like i want to do what i what, what is right you know but sometimes i can't so he's kind of like questioning this will so like that's the closest they get but they don't use the term it's only in 380 a.d when saint augustine augustine of hippo right made a saint he's like trying to figure out all right because the, the the basic belief is god is good god is all good so like he's trying to say well, god is all good how come there's evil in the world? So like, so like, he's trying to like, so he's saying, well, if, if God didn't create the evil, then it must be our fault. Now here's one thing, like um, Augustine fails to, neglects to, to, to understand that actually within the Christian theology that he believed in, there's this force, this entity, this whatever that God created called Satan or the devil or Lucifer, whatever you want to call it. And like Augustine could easily have blamed, you know, the, this entity for, for the, the evil, but he chose to blame us. He, he coined the term free will. Um, yeah, and to add to that, um, even going back to Genesis, the story of Adam, Adam and Eve, uh, I guess you could say the snake represents the devil, Satan. Um, Maybe not at the time, um, it, you know, at the time it was written, like it probably um, represented it after uh, Christianity developed. But still, like God banishes them from the Garden of Eden without really taking into consideration, well, wait a minute, he was the one who designed them this way. So it's sort of like building a... Um, a dysfunctional toaster and being angry at the toaster for not working as opposed to the toaster maker. Yeah, can you appreciate <laughs> that logic? I mean, if God would, God, if God would have made Adam and Eve, you know, if we, um, more intelligent, less, you know, because they were deceived by the serpent, or more obedient, whatever, you know, that, that they wouldn't have, like, done what they weren't supposed to do. And also, God is supposed to be omniscient, um, you know, all-knowing, so, like, he's, he knew that they were going to fail this test. I mean, all right. But the, the, the fundamental thing, why, why is free will such a powerful illusion? You know, one reason is because, like, of the church, you know, religion, it's not just, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you know, various other religions, whatever, they say to people, well, you know, like, if you don't believe what we tell you to, because that's essentially what they're saying, you know, then you, because you have a free will, you are blameworthy and, 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 and so evil that you deserve to, to suffer for the rest of eternity. If you tell somebody that, if you tell a five-year-old that, a six-year-old that, you know, like, very early in his life, I mean, you think like as an adult that 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 
person is going to like a challenge what the church or religion says? No, I mean, basically the religion indoctrinates with fear, with the, with the most horrible punishment imaginable so that people like can't, don't think, you know, people are, you know, why is free will such a powerful illusion? Because people are afraid to understand that it's an illusion because they're afraid of the church, they're afraid of this belief in hell. That's one reason. Right, and also, like, let's say free will even is possible, okay? Let's say at the time monotheism or Christianity developed, um, you know, what's going on at the other side of the country? Like, okay, the people in the Americas or in China or um, in Africa, uh, lower Africa, like, they have a free will, but they have no... Um, they don't know what's going on up in the Middle East. So even if they were to have free will, it makes no sense because they have no exposure to even have the so-called right belief. Exactly. So so, some religions say, like, for example, sense. if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer eternally. But how about if you never heard of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, absolutely. Okay. Um, Another reason, another reason why free will is such a powerful illusion, this one makes a lot more sense, okay? The, 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 you know, I don't understand how people believe, you know, that an all good God is going to, like, condemn anyone to, like, eternal suffering for, like, you know, what we do in, like, 80, 100 years. I mean, it makes no sense anyhow. But one that makes a lot more sense is this concept of egoism. We like to take credit for what we do in all. Mike, I'll explain that in more detail. So in order to believe in free will, you have to believe in a person who can will freely. And that person um, is self-image, which is the ego, in other, in other words, which is why we call it um, egoism. And so um, it feeds the ego to believe you have free will, as opposed to believing that you're just um, sort of the puppet of causality. Yeah, we, we like, you know, we like to like when we do something, you know, creative, when we do it, when we achieve something, we win an award or something, we like to believe that we did it, that we didn't have to, that we're not a puppet. We like to take credit for this stuff, you know, and like the irony is, is like the universe, this cause and effect makes us like to do this. In other words, we, we like to take credit for this because the universe compels us to, so then because the universe compels us to like to take credit for what we, we do for not being a, a puppet, the universe thereupon, because of that, makes us not want to believe or accept that we don't have a free will. Okay, it, it gets beyond, so like that, that's pretty easy to understand, so but still, like, I mean, you can understand, like, all right, let's say, let's say you shift from the egoism to in other words, if you, you understand that we don't have a free will, nobody has a free will, so when you do get something good and you, know, you achieve something, how do you, how do you interpret that? How, how do you feel in all? Um, with the belief in free will? No, without, without it. Without, without yeah. the belief in free will, you're just going to um, assume that, you're just going to see that um, it was almost like a lottery. Like, for the example, for example, I didn't choose to have the ability to be a songwriter or, um, or be a composer. It's just my nurturing and uh, even genetics like allowed that to be a possibility. So I can't really have um, an ego about it since it was sort of uh, luck in the end. And if I were born a different person, I'd have other, um, you know, things the other talents or um, flaws even. It's, it's really a big lottery. Exactly. So, you know, first it's a matter of luck. And second, like, it's not like you don't enjoy it. Like, you know, you just, you just compose a song that you're going to have it produced and all. I mean, you're grateful. You're grateful that the universe um, allowed you to do that. So, like, go ahead. But as we understand, like, it doesn't prevent narcissism because those with an ego who still um, believe in causal will or don't believe in free will can still say, ah, the universe chose me, therefore I'm special, I'm more special than you. Um, or if, if something negative happens, you know, they could still uh, feel like, ah, why did, um, why does the universe hate me? Why did I get the short end of the stick or whatever? You're right. I mean, like, in a certain sense, I mean, we, we could, like, let's say we say, uh, you know, 
Because, like, I think it makes that kind of, like, arrogance for something more difficult. But even even in terms, like, somebody says, well, you know, yes, the universe chose me. I'm special in law. But, like, the answer to that in a certain sense, and you're right, you know, it does make it harder. But one could even say to that, like, yeah, but it wasn't, like, up to you to be special. In other words, <laughs> you know, you, you was, like, yeah. absolutely, you know. <laughs> but they might feel it was, like, divinely willed. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Yeah. All right. So, so another. You're right. It's not going to, com- you know, uh, completely eliminate egoism. It's, it's, it's a g- step in the direction of truth, though. Absolutely. That's all that truth and yeah. humility. Yes. All right. So no, let's go to the legal system. Um, basically, why is such a f- um, free will such a powerful illusion? Um, let me let me explain this in some detail. What happens is the legal system does recognize. For example, different levels of guilt, you know, premeditated or, you know, negligent or whatever. I mean, like, it has a, a stipulation where it's like, if you didn't understand the, um, the implications of what you were doing, then that, that's kind of like, you know, that's a defense, you know, against being um, charged and all. But the, the point, this point is like, even though the, our legal system is sophisticated enough to understand different kind of like levels of guilt, it yet doesn't understand that free will is an illusion. As a matter of fact, in 1978 or so, the Supreme Court actually decided that free will exists, which is like so insane that these, these, these six guys or nine guys or whatever on this court could, um, could make that kind of a decision. It's the only thing that could uh, justify the idea of punishment, really just for the sake of um, someone committed a crime, okay, now somehow you have to balance out uh, morality, take it into your own hands, and uh, punish the person as if, you know, it'll undo whatever was done. But, um, what was I going to say? Like, under the free will um, paradigm, that's the only way it could work. But no free will, you'd still... Um, separate those people from society. They still wouldn't be running around the streets, you know, we're not advocating that, oh, everybody's forgiven, therefore, you know, we're going to be naive about it. That's not the case. What's going to happen is we still remove them, but it's just for the sake of not just... not just making society safer by their removal, but... um, trying to understand what the causes were that led them uh, to do whatever um, atrocity or crime they committed, which was the effect of some previous cause. Excellent. Yeah, because in other words, like, under our legal system now, you know, somebody does something wrong and, and we're, you know, I mean, Basically, no, the, the idea is like, if people believe, people fear that if we got rid of this belief in free will, then, then people would just say, well, you can't blame me so I can do whatever you want. No, that, that's not what we're saying. As Mike explained, we'd still have to hold people accountable. But the problem is in today's legal system, basically the judge, the, the, the system itself says like, you did evil of your own free will, you're an evil person, you're a criminal, you know, and they, they use such pejorative, indictive, you know, vengeful language. So what happens, like two things happen. One is, is like that because of that, everybody kind of like tends to believe in free will. They say, well, the legal system believes in free will, it must be so. The second part is like the criminals, the people who commit the crime, if we're labeling them as evil, as immoral, as criminals, that's how they're going to see themselves because, you know, they can't like separate themselves from this powerful force coming from outside. Yeah. Of them. It's, it's like the godfather, you know, Al Pacino, like, I'm the bad guy. You got to point your finger at someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and the last thing is like, it really, it, you know, not only does it, you know, encourage and amplify this belief in free will, but then it encouraged us as society to hate people, to hate all these criminals, which, you know, basically what the criminal justice should be saying to them is, listen, we understand that what you did was not your fault. That is that extremely important to understand. It wasn't you who did it. We just have to, like, separate you. We have to do something because we have to uphold law and order. Now, if you're a criminal, if you did something wrong, that's, that makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more compassionate and intelligent, you know, than, than our, our indictive, you know, hateful system. 
Right. Since we only have like seven, <clears throat> seven and a half minutes yet, I wanted to bring up um, my three-point explanation on why free will it is perceived to be such a powerful illusion. Absolutely. Which is that, okay, one, you have a set of uh, future outcomes that you picture in your mind. And step two is that you prefer one of those future outcomes over the others. Step three is that you decide to act on them. Now, that is what we experience as being free will since it happens, you know, right in our conscious mind. We could observe this um, effect taking place. We could observe all the pictures of whatever future outcomes we're fantasizing or imagining and um, whichever one we prefer and whichever one we prefer to act on. And But the reason uh, it's actually not free will is because we don't choose what our choices are, for one. Um, if we could, you know, we then, in a sense, you could say we have free will, but we don't. We're bound by all sorts of things, um, nature and nurture, really. And two is we don't choose which of those choices we're going to prefer. Um, we, it's just wired in our unconscious, whichever one of those choices we're going to prefer, whether it's pick a card, any card, or you're, prevent, you're presented with uh, food options or job opportunities. So these are things that <clears throat> take place <clears throat> in uh, the unconscious mind for the most part, in the emotional centers of our brain. All right. Um, so, all right. Let me let me get this because this is important. It's, it's a bit complex. The the one reason why this is such a powerful illusion because like point one is we believe we have choices before us, actual choices. Yeah, we picture all the future outcomes um, in our head. Okay. And then point two is like we prefer one outcome over the others. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, then what the point three? Can you um, explain that one more time? And point three is that we act on that preference. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. So, no, in other words, like, it just seems like if we, if we just look at our actions, it seems like because we're acting on our preference, it's up to us. It's our preference. But as Mike was just pointing out, sure, it's our preference, but we don't decide. We don't get to decide yeah. what our preferences are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, we don't choose our choices or our preference. Absolutely. For whatever choices we do have. Okay. I think maybe another good reason, because you gotta, you got to understand, like, over half of philosophers, academic philosophers with PhDs don't get this. They can't accept that, um, I mean, partly it's psychological, and they're in denial, it's part of this, this thing about egoism and all. But another thing is like, obviously, if causality, we did a show on this just previously, if cause and effect makes free will so impossible, the, 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 the simple reason it does is that everything has a cause, and that's such a simple concept to understand, you know, the question becomes, why don't these academics understand this? And like my answer to this is like poor critical thinking skills. In other words, like you get through school, K through 12, through college even, and you don't have to you don't have to know how to think. You don't have to be strong in logic. All you have to do is learn what they teach you, you know, memorize it, and then recite it back to them for the test. Maybe apply it, you apply it in a few instances. You haven't you don't have to understand what you're learning, and that's the problem. These philosophers, they just read what other philosophers um, you know, wrote. They, they're not trained to think about it because, again, if they were, they couldn't like come up with this absurd notion that, that we, we have free will. Um, and, and even like the more absurd kind of like attempt, sophist attempt to just like try to preserve free will by changing the definition. So poor it, it, it seems like the biggest uh, mistake or the biggest uh, misunderstanding is that the academics confuse um, self-awareness with free will. And they see free will possibly as like an emergent property of our evolution sometimes. Oh. Like you ever see that? I've heard that. Emergent property is kind of like a relatively new term, but yes, absolutely. In other words, like that it emerges, but all right, explain why it emerging wouldn't give us a free will. Right. So 
they confuse it with self-awareness and what self-awareness is okay one part of the brain becomes aware of another uh, process in the brain and so it could observe itself and sort of make uh, corrections it could sort of um, tweak it like it feels like we're tweaking our own behavior through our own self-awareness but that's not free will because the impulse to um, for self-development or self-perfection still isn't um, our own. It's part of our biology, it's part of our uh, natural psychology, it's just, it's just there. And more fundamentally, these emergent properties have causes. Yeah, they you have causes. You can't have something emerging that doesn't have a cause, so once an emergent property has a cause, there is a causal antecedent to that and a causal antecedent to that, so you can't escape this, this fundamental causal law that we did a show about whenever, that you know, if if we all had better critical skills, we could understand and like, so like, you know, that our educational system. Okay, um, and all right, my last point here is that actually in a certain sense, it's not such a powerful illusion, um, but that's a little complex. We have like a, a minute and a half. Just basically quickly, it's like, like people say that like, yeah, it feels like we have a free will, and actually, it doesn't really, in a sense. We're taught that. We're taught that by our parents and, and, and um, society. Basically, what it feels like is that we're making, it's like we're choosing, right? We're making decisions, but it, that, that's what it feels like. But, you know, this belief in free will is that we're making decisions and the decisions are up to us. So, in a certain sense, we could say it doesn't even feel like we have free will. We're taught that. All right, we've got about a minute left. Um, let's talk about our shows. Let's talk about our Manhattan show. So we have a show in Manhattan. Um, it's a live show. You can call in and um, argue with us or tell us how much you agree with us or ask questions if you don't totally uh, get what we're saying or you want um, some you know, clarity on uh, one of the topics we raised. So. Yeah, call in, uh, when's the next one? Actually, the next one, I'm not sure. It's like, we're, we're taping like once a month now, but we're going to inc increase the, that. We might like be on live every week, but it's like MNN, um, Manhattan Channel 56, three away from the Yankee games, one away from Al Jazeera, one away from the movies. You know, it's in, in um, high definition digital. Our show isn't, but it's like within those channels. All right, thanks for watching. We're going to like keep doing shows. This is episode 168. We're going to keep doing shows until you get it. Thanks for right, watching. Thanks for watching.